Welcome back to the Abide Project. My name is Pastor Lloyd Hemstreet, and Synod 2022 is done. They finished right on schedule on Thursday at 3 p.m. Uh, since our last update with Reverend Tyler Wagamaker and myself, a couple of things did occur. On Wednesday evening, they went ahead and approved the general secretary. So Zachary King is the first one to fill that new old position that is uh, kind of being brought back to life through the SALT report, which was approved by the Synod. Then on Thursday morning, they finished up with uh, Neyland Avenue and the situation there in Grand Rapids East. They went ahead and uh, formed a committee in loco to deal with that situation and uh, bring admonishment and correction to uh, help come alongside and bring Grand Rapids East back into line. Thinking about this synod and the things that have been accomplished by it this year, uh, you know, it didn't take long on the floor of synod in the, the heated debates. The longest debate was certainly over the confessional status to these things. Uh, in those debates, and then especially if you looked on Facebook, on the, the Banners website, or followed comments on Twitter, we heard all kinds of different accusations coming against those that spoke and those that have uh, held out on, on these things, those that were saying, hey, this needs to be confessional, this is important, this is what the church believes, this is where we stand, and this is what we must do. There were all kinds of attacks, you know, the attacks about a loveless uh, Christianity, loveless orthodoxy, the charges of, of bigotry and otherwise that we would expect. But if we listen to actually what was taking place on the floor, if we listen to the arguments that were being made and put forth, you know, we hear a very different tone. We hear a very different voice. We recognize that people making these arguments knew the weight of the matter. They knew what was taking place, but they also, as I mentioned, as we mentioned in the last video, had that here we stand moment. We can do no other. And so what I want to play for you now is about seven clips on not in exact order of how they took place at Synod, but we're going to listen to seven of the different speakers. I think two of these guys have written for the Abide Project. The other five, I don't know if they even know the Abide Project uh, exists, but go ahead and listen now and hear from them how they speak and how they spoke on the floor of Synod. Zach, you, uh, you have the floor now. Zach Dewey. Class of Central California, I just want to speak in favor of this motion. I think this is a holy moment. Let's not fool ourselves. I look around and I see people that I've grown to love over the past five days. People that I appreciate. People that I know I disagree with. And I know disagree with me. People that I would love to have a meal with, people I would love to have a Canadian Bible study with. I've learned that for the first time this week. And I learned that I don't have to be Canadian to go to those. But the first point that I, I want to just speak to, I've heard a lot of talk of comparison between this issue with the issue of women's ordination. I do not think that is a valid comparison. These are two totally different things. One of these issues, and I speak as a complementarian, and I hold to that position pretty seriously. Although I guess I'm here at the CRC, I can be a part of a denomination where people disagree with me, and I'm okay with that. In fact, I appreciate that. But as a complementarian, I can notice that there are legitimate texts of Scripture that at least give some material for women's ordination. It is not absolutely clear, whereas with the issue before us here, I think it is. So that's my first thing. I think the scriptures are very clear. The next thing is the issue of harm. This is a big one. I do not say this lightly, but I think we all admit, those of us on the both, both sides here, think that the other side is deeply and profoundly causing spiritual harm to the other. That is an issue. That leads us to two totally radical, radically different ways of counseling and working with people. And we are totally opposed to how each other handle pastoral care. And so we have to recognize that. 
I, I, I don't do that lightly. I don't take, I don't, I don't look over that. But I think we are real, we both genuinely believe that the other side is seriously damaging people's souls. And that is something for us to consider. I think there are two totally different ways of thinking here, and I do not see, sadly, as much as I would love to, I'm one who talks a lot about ecumenism. I care about the unity of the church, global and historic, but I do not see how this is an issue that can be resolved. Jason Rice, Classes Wisconsin. Recently, I sat with a man struggling with gender identity issues. I wept with him. I'm about to weep now. I held him in my arms, told him I loved him. I would walk with him through this. But part of his struggle was around a lack of clarity because he had differing church leaders telling him that we're not clear on this issue. And he was already feeling torn apart on the inside. And now he's feeling torn apart by church leaders as well. And he wanted to know what to do. He wanted to honor God, but he just didn't know. (laughs) And what's the most loving thing to do? Say, I don't know. This provides clarity. This, this, I speak in favor of this because this provides clarity for me to love the people in my community that I am walking alongside discipling in the Lord. Our catechism says, what's involved in genuine repentance or conversion? Two things, the dying away of the old self and the rising to life of the new. What is the dying away of the old self? To be genuinely sorry for sin and more and more to hate it and run away from it. And then what is the rising to life of the new self? Wholehearted joy in God through Christ. And a love to delight to live according to the will of God by doing every kind of good work. If we don't have clarity, I don't have a direction to point him to the wholehearted joy in Christ. We just sit in the mud. That's why I speak for this motion. Blake Campbell, Classes of Vienna, I speak in favor of the motion. Out of Catechism 108, it says, what does the seventh commandment teach us that God condemns all unchastity? You know the rest of what that answer says. A couple of the scripture passages that are referred to there are Leviticus 18. Of course, you know Leviticus 18 is one of the chapters that speaks about homosexuality as well as a number of other sexual sins, many of which are up on the screen for us at the end of Leviticus 18, verse 30, which is referenced here in Q&A 108. It says, keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. And the answer or the reason why is, I am the Lord your God. Ephesians 5, 3. Of course, Ephesians speaks about husbands and wives. But among you, there must not be any hint, any hint, let alone action, of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. This is imperative, and our own confession speaks to this sin already. Behind me, Mr. Leroy brought in a question that if this is made confessional status, then what would it mean for some of our office bearers? How would it impact them? He referenced specifically what I believe is homosexuality or same-sex attraction, which is not what is being referred to here in this motion. It specifically says homosexual sex, not attraction or feelings or identity. It's an action that we are referring to here. This does not affect our office bearers who are either same-sex, attracted, or heterosexual who live chaste lives. Another comment was made that if this teaching of the HSR is given confessional status, then what? Should we make stained glass windows confessional? Should we make ministry shares confessional? I'm sure John Bolt would like that. (laughs) 
But stained glass windows are not mentioned in the Bible. So that is a straw man argument at best. Women in office has also been referenced here, but as far as I know, and I have three daughters and a wife, it's not a sin to be a woman. Another point, final point I'll make. It's been mentioned multiple times that we need to listen to our children and our grandchildren, to which I agree I have three of them, and I listen to them daily. But what I do not do is go to my children for sexual advice, wisdom, or ethics. I do not ask my children what is holy or unholy, what is righteous or evil, what is right and wrong. We don't ask our children for help or wisdom on paying our taxes or marriage advice, hopefully. And I certainly hope we don't seek sexual ethics and morality from our children. Our children need us to be courageous. They need us to be leaders. They need us to be Christ followers that do not bend to culture. Mr. President, Craig Hukuma from uh, Classless Eastern Canada. Um, I speak in favor of the motion. Um, not with, uh, with great joy, um, with an extremely heavy heart. Um, the word unchastity in our confessions has to have meaning. It has to have some substantive meaning. And we have to make a distinction between caring for people who are engaged in sin versus what the church teaches. So an example was given about what about how we respond to uh, you know, a child out of wedlock or something like that. I hope we've learned to be much more gracious and do a much better job. But what we haven't done is allow teachers in the church to be in teaching that premarital sex is okay. We've done a better job of caring pastorally for people caught in any of these sins. Mm -hmm. But what we haven't done is allow teachers in the church to teach that those sinful behaviors are okay. I wish this were an issue where, where we could just agree to disagree. I wish it were. That's my heart. I'm actually a pretty peace-loving kind of guy. I hate this. I really do. Um, but when I read what scripture says about sexual immorality, for me to hold this view with integrity, when scripture says flee from sexual immorality, when it says not a hint of sexual immorality, when Jesus in the context of talking about sexual immorality says cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, when Paul talks about the seriousness of teachers using grace as a license for immorality. I wish this were the kind of thing where I could go, yes, let's make space and agree to disagree. I can't. My conscience does not allow it. If I'm to have integrity as an office bearer, integrity to my convictions, integrity to the promises I made to shepherd the flock of Jesus Christ, this for me is a here I stand kind of moment. I've lost a lot of sleep over it. I wouldn't be shaking as much as I am if I thought this were a we could all just get along kind of issue. I understand the implications of my view on my fellow office bearers and fellow church members. I don't delight in that. I don't delight in that. But I believe we need to stand. I believe the word unchastity has to have specific meaning to govern the teaching of the church. So I speak in favor of the motion. Dan DeGraff, Lake Superior Classes, a uh, big guy in a suit for a reason he doesn't know when it's 95 degrees out and sweating my head off. Uh, I speak in favor of this motion, uh, but I echo my brother Craig's comments. Uh, I stand here with fear and trembling, Mr. Chair, uh, because it is so important. Uh, I grew up in First CRC South Holland, which is lamentably First OPC of South Holland now, or First Church. Uh, went to Cottage Grove CRC, and I, I bring that up because I was in catechism at third grade. I was in catechism again at seventh grade. I was in catechisms throughout high school, like many of you uh, who have grown up in this denomination. Uh, but that instilled in me uh, the summary of the catechism. It instilled in me that sin, salvation, service, guilt, grace, gratitude. And I bring that up because we're not just saying what a single word means in this. We're not just saying it's about the word unchastity and, and what that means in question and answer 108. But we're talking about, about how that lives in the catechism. That this isn't just a confessional issue, but it is a gospel issue. Because the hope, the promise, the guarantee that we have of belonging to Christ in question and answer 1, it, it requires that we receive grace through faith. And what is faith about? Question and answer 2 tells us. 
We have to believe and know how great our sin and misery are. We have to know how we're set free from all our sins and misery. And we have to know how we are to thank God for such deliverance. And question and answer 87 tells us that salvation is not for those who will not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways. And so what are we to do? What are we to do when we recognize something unchaste, when we recognize the laws, the sins that the catechism sets forth, which again are, are, are also instruct us to live in gratitude? It reminds us that the old must die. The old self must be put away. And we have to know, we have to understand what that means. And the new self must rise to life that we might live in wholehearted joy, living for the glory of God. And so I invite us to, to not just think of question and answer 108, but think about the story of the catechism. Again, the larger context of question and answer 108 explains that God condemns all unchastity and that therefore we should thoroughly detest it and live decent and chaste lives. Again, God changes everything. He can make us completely new. Thank you. Robert Van Zanen from Thornapple Valley. I speak in favor of the motion, even though I know that it will probably tear us apart, even though I grew up at Neeland, and I have many dear friends there, many dear friends from college and seminary who I know I will not be serving in ministry alongside. I know that there are deep personal relational implications for if we accede to this motion. I know that there are deep implications for our organizations, for our seminary and our, our university. I know there are deep, deep implications. And yet it is not we who affirm this, Lord willing, who have moved or changed what has been taught throughout the history of the Christian church. It is those who have taught something other than this that have departed from the Christian church and its history. And friends, it is hard to make this decision, and it sucks. And yet we have to do it. We have to do it to speak with clarity on our convictions, to stand up for the truth of the gospel, because it is a different gospel that we each imagine. I am... I believe in a gospel that transforms lives, that has changed me, that changes others, where sin is not what is in charge, but the Spirit is in charge, and the Spirit transforms us and sets us free. I believe in that gospel. I've seen it at work in myself. I've seen it at work in the people in my church. It's hard. We're all wrestling with what the implications of this would be, I wrestle with the implications of living out a faithful Christian life every single day with people in my church, struggling together to know how to do this, what needs to be disciplined, how we walk with people in this, in these struggles. But we have to recognize truth even as we recognize grace. And those two things have to go hand in hand. They can't be separated. And I know that there's going to be churches and people that take a really heavy-handed approach with truth, and they lose sight of the grace in the midst of all these things. And I pray, I pray that we can have that radical hospitality, that radical grace, that love, and that people who disagree with us, we can, we can still find room to worship alongside them. But we have to be clear, even when it tears us apart. Because grace and truth go hand in hand, and this is truth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Clumpeen, Classes Heartland. Um, I speak in favor of the motion because I believe it brings clarity. Uh, I also have a concern. Um, heard speakers say we can't know the future, the implications of this decision today, and that is true. Only God knows. But the implications of obedience today, let's think of the opposite. The implications of disobedience today. Isaiah 59, verse 2, Is the arm of the Lord too short, or his ear too dull to hear? No, but your sins have separated you from God so that he will not hear. Now, we've prayed for him to hear. It would be good for us then, in line with that, to also ask what sin is. 
The consequences of obedience, however, will be the pleasure of God today. Jesus said, I have not come for the righteous, but for sinners. My only claim on Jesus is my sin, in one sense. And if we then list certain sins, but not others, we exclude some from his very salvation. And I think the clarity that this brings then includes, actually not excludes, but includes those who might wish to be excluded in one sense. No, we would not want to be excluded from the one who came to save sinners and who not only forgives sins, but takes us out of sin. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's how we today must know the implications of this decision. I speak in favor of the motion. Powerful, powerful words there from the floor of Synod. You know, these charges that we're seeing online, and I mean, we've seen the post, the, the protests talking about lament, those talking about how they were, were, were harmed, how they were hurt by what took place. You know, there are those that are saying, this has opened up wounds. And we understand how that can be. We understand the, the, the heaviness and the weightiness of, of these things. But at the same time, Synod has spoken. The church has spoken. It is spoken in line with God's word and it is spoken a faithful message. You know, a uh, passage that has been in my mind uh, the last couple of days is from the book of Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. To those that were wounded, to those that are hurting, to those that are, are burdened by the decisions of sin, we would ask you to, to come and, and wrestle together and look at the heart of those wounds and how they were given. They were not given with any hatred. There is no animosity, but rather they are the call of the gospel, the call to come and turn to life. You know, as I was uh, watching the, the views on uh the Bide Project YouTube page, one of the videos that was taking off over the, our time of Synod with numerous hundred views was the interview with Beckett Cook that we did a little over a month and a half ago or so. Now, Beckett Cook is a man that has really struggled. He has wrestled with this, living in a, a homosexual, same-sex attracted lifestyle with partners. And then he heard the call of the gospel. He felt those wounds, and he turned to Christ and saw the, the beauty, the wonder. He's a man that speaks like Paul that says, you know what, I have call, counted everything as lost for the sake of Jesus Christ. That is what is being held out by Synod this year. The call to faithful and costly obedience. It's not fun for any of us to take up our cross and follow after Christ. Yet that is what he commands us to do. That is what he calls us to do. And that is what he, by his spirit, empowers us to do. And so think on those thoughts. Think on these things as you consider how sin it has spoken and how Christ is calling you to follow faithfully after him.